So, hi, hi Lauren and Kyle. How are you? How are you doing in LA at the moment? Yeah, we're all right. Um, you know, it's morning here and uh, things are a little wild in the States, but... Yeah, we're doing okay. How are you? Uh, good. Probably not quite as crazy as the U US, but the UK is following on behind. So, yeah. But, um, yes. So we're here to talk about your piece, um, Vibe Check, which is the amazing piece, which is right at the beginning of Hex exhibition, Real Feelings, Emotion and Technology. It's right at the beginning. It's the first thing which visitors see and the last thing they encounter as well. So I wondered if you could tell us about the inspiration behind this extraordinary piece. You want to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. So. <clears throat> This piece, um, in some ways, it started with a, an older project that we worked on called People Keeper, um, where we were uh, kind of asking people to wear a wrist brand that would track their emotions and um, identify how different people that they hung out with were making them feel and then automatically manage their social life. We only have so much emotional bandwidth Bring it in. and limited time. Mustafa? Mustafa? Our social circles are widening. We don't know that's bad, but all those relationships in general that makes you excited just can be overwhelming. Now there's an app. People Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out and it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out and makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up and let People Keeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships, so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good and blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social life with People Keeper. But this piece works a little differently. Uh, do you want to describe how this <laughs> okay. piece works? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so basically you enter the space and um you there are cameras throughout the gallery and they are detecting whenever there's people near each other and they're interacting they're sort of looking at the emotional effect that people are having on each other and then as the people move through the space the system identifies like which people are making are creating the biggest emotional impact so which people in the space um when there's people around them they're expressing you know strong emotions of disgust or glee um, or sadness um, and then as you come back around to the exit you see again these screens that you mentioned that are are in the entrance exit and it's basically this uh, series of six screens that are scanning photos that were taken in the gallery and then zooming in on the different faces that it identifies as um, the people that are you know having a large emotional impact and the text on the screen will say like they make us feel most contempt or they make us feel most calm um and that's that's sort of the piece and the idea is to raise questions about um about surveillance and, and um, the way that plays in terms of our social interactions and our emotional response to each other um but to do it in a way that feels less like uh like Big Brother and more like Instagram, like in this kind of um, playful way where you feel sort of uncertain in terms of like, is this something uh, everyone's doing and I kind of want to engage with or is this actually a, a encroaching on my own privacy? And that's the great thing about your work, isn't it? That you open up this space for people to encounter technology and then work out how they feel about it. You're not imposing your own feelings on it. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we do have our own feelings about it, but um, our goal here isn't to express them. Our goal is to give people a chance to explore their feelings. I think a lot of the time, this kind of technology is you know, being used behind the scenes. It's being used in this really slow way that we don't really see the results of it um, happening and we don't really get to reflect on it until there's some problem with it. Um, but 
in the context of an exhibition like this, we can kind of take the tech and put it front and center and let people engage with it um, kind of in real time in a way that lets them feel something instead of just waiting for a problem to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we like to create that kind of space. Yeah, I mean, I would say we are expressing our, our own opinions and feelings about these technologies, but like, and if you look at any piece, the, we're quite critical of these technologies and, and that critique I think is clear. Yeah. But we're doing in, we're also playing with ambiguity in a way that um, depending on who's coming to the piece, they may have different interpretations. And I think the goal there is to um, provoke a conversation about these different interpretations or these different relationships to it and then to provide the space for people to kind of unpack that because a lot of times I think we are presented with new technologies and, and asked to react really quickly to either like buy this or like that or don't use that and a lot of times it's just not so black and white there, there are things to unpack there and so we're trying to create a space where you can really engage with that tension. So how does the technology read the emotions? Is it just from the faces or is it also from the body movements as well? So in this case, we're just working with the faces, um, which has been an interesting challenge because there's so many people wearing masks right now. Um, fortunately, we were able to get around um, the problem of face detection being kind of fooled by masks and we are detecting people's faces, but um, when we ask the computer to make a judgment about um, someone's face who's masked, uh, you know, what expression is on their face, the computer has to make some kind of judgment. It can't say, oh, I don't know, they're wearing a mask. It sort of has to slot them into one of these categories. Um, and that's, that's been an interesting challenge to see, um, yeah, to just see that dynamic of classification play out in our installation. Um, it sort of mirrors the way that classification works more broadly when these systems are rolled out in the real world. Um, there's rarely an option uh, in a kind of machine learning system to say, oh, you know, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> um, there's always an answer, right? And uh, that's one of the, yeah, we're, we're seeing that with our work too. And I think it, it relates to how we experience each other with masks on. You know, in some part of our mind, we know we can't really interpret the facial expression with the half the face covered, but we, I think we do anyway, or yeah. we kind of project what we imagine onto that person in a similar way that this system is kind of like projecting in the slightest um, interpretation onto the, onto the person using, you know, the algorithm. And you had also another challenge, didn't you? Just not just the masks, but also, isn't this the first time you've done a remote installation of one of your pieces? It's definitely, it's the first time we've done one of this complexity. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work where we've guided people remotely, usually on work that we've produced previously and installed elsewhere previously. And then, you know, someone else can kind of <laughs> receive it in the mail and set it up. Um, but this is I, certainly the first time we've done one of this complexity when this is the first time it's being shown. And um, there were a lot of uh, kind of technical and aesthetic challenges that went into that, um, or that came out of that. Um, you know, we, we, we had a very, we had great internet access from HEC that allowed us to like, you know, be almost like we're there um, by connecting to all the cameras and connecting to the computer. Um, but there's still a lot of things that we can't answer that way. And there's a lot of things we can't tweak that way, like the camera positions and, um, understanding the, you know, exact, like how the perspective of the camera plays out and the feeling of the images that are produced. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's normally a work like this that's so site specific and then also interactive. Um, that's exactly the kind of work you want to be there <laughs> to install, but it just wasn't possible. Um, but it's, it's also interesting for us because it really feels like a continuation of a lot of the, the work around remoteness that we've been doing. Um, like I've spent the last few years doing these performances where I'm setting up cameras and like looking into people's homes and controlling them remotely. So um, it wasn't such a stretch to be, and in fact, I even did a performance like that in heck about a year ago. So it wasn't, it felt like familiar to be again, looking through these live, you know, camera feeds into that gallery. Um, and in general, like 
thinking about our practice like it feels like um like you we are like 100 percent certified media artists now all of us you know like that have, are all doing these kind of remote talks and and installations and um in one hand it feels almost uh it's something we're very comfortable with and on the other hand there's it definitely feels strange some days to just be sitting in front of my computer and then like realize these you know different interventions and performances are happening in like, different places <laughs> this is my like portal to them but you're checking in daily aren't you you're checking in daily for example into heck yeah definitely and there is um there is something kind of nice about you know typically when we need to show up to install a work uh we have a few days on site and then maybe one day after an opening to sort of see what the fallout is <laughs> how it turned out you know how people responded to it and how the piece is still running um, and there's something kind of nice about there not being any transition um, this time we don't have to go home and then you know wait a few days and then see what we can do remotely we sort of built up infrastructure for observing remotely and now we are continuing to observe and it's a little bit more like we get to stay there in some ways <laughs> so there's a positive to it as well <laughs> and as you said it, the the piece vibe check actually um builds on um people keeper and i wanted if you could tell us a little bit more about that how it actually built on that in terms of the technology but also the aesthetic because the aesthetic is very very important to you both as well as well as the playfulness which is always in your work yeah um i think when we made people keeper which was in 2014 it was kind of around this idea that uh like the aesthetic was mimicking um a lot of these like startups that were kind of um coming up at the time around like fitness trackers and um uh quantified self and i think with but the thing that we were really interested in it with it that was that it, was, it went beyond like a website or a video it was actually an app that people could download and use and we did trials with it um with different groups of people and that was i think the part that was most interesting was just like you know there was the kind of surface reaction people might have seeing this kind of viral intervention online but then when people actually used it they would have sort of a deeper engagement and reflection on some of the issues at hand and so I think we really wanted to bring that that kind of um, experience into into the gallery with this piece. And our initial idea was um, to make a version of People Keeper where there's just someone at the door greeting each person, and that interaction was being analyzed. And then I think it was um, Sabina's uh, suggestion: like, could you um, expand that and think about the whole gallery space as a site and that was really um interesting to us to think of it almost as because that was kind of like people keeper one of the main ideas was to have this almost like layer that went over all social interaction and so in this piece we're thinking about it as this like layer that kind of um ambiently lays over the the exhibition yeah and i think we're familiar with those layers in our daily life from um you know new technologies that are maybe foisted upon us by uh you know states and uh and companies where you know suddenly one day you have an app and you can call a driver to the front of your house and suddenly some other day like the every time that you cross the street the crosswalk is identifying whether you're jaywalking or not <laughs> um if you're in china and uh these kind of layers of awareness are continually kind of added and, and removed and augmented in our daily lives by these new technologies and i think um uh yeah the the gallery is a space to kind of explore like the sort of temporary addition of those kinds of layers um but yeah and to speak to the other part of the question about the aesthetics um I guess I touched on this a little bit already, but we're we're really interested in exploring like what are the aesthetics of surveillance right now, and so the um, interface itself and the screens draws a lot of inspiration from like Instagram stories and the way that it's kind of like zoom in effect um, and just sort of that that like awkward playfulness between something that feels a lot like surveillance but also looks very um, approachable or friendly. Um, and then when even when you're thinking about these cameras throughout the gallery that are just these little boxes 
we made these cases for them. And when we were thinking about the design, we were thinking about just like those kind of plastic iPhone cases, you know, these things that like what you're holding is a computer or a surveillance device or um, like a really powerful tool um, uh, with a lot of, you know, social and political implications, but it is packaged as if it's something very, um, you know, like a toy or, or something very friendly or cute and like negotiating that tension was interesting for us in this piece. Yeah, we were trying to pick like, you know, sort of saturated color for the case. It's this kind of bright purple. Um, and uh, with the cameras themselves, we were trying to get them kind of just below eye level. So there's a different feeling of, um, you know, like one point perspective, it's kind of typical uh, gallery installation photo perspective. It looks very cool. Everything's kind of at right angles to each other, um, as opposed to the typical kind of surveillance perspective, which is above eye level, looking down, kind of exerting power, um, or maybe not typical, maybe sort of pre older, yeah, like kind of pre, um, pre social media surveillance perspective. Um, we're trying to get away from, you know, the numbers over the image, the very long floating point numbers. We're trying to get away from, um, you know, uh, red and white and black uh, <laughs> kind of outlines and, uh, you know, boxes around faces and this kind of thing that is um, really typically identified with them. Um, is sort of, I don't know, we need a better name for it, but it's sort of like Terminator style surveillance aesthetics. <laughs> um, we're, yeah, it's not really the way that surveillance happens these days. And um, I think that there's, you know, if, if people see this and reflect on it and feel surveilled from the same thing, from the same aesthetics that they're used to in their daily social media experience, um, I hope that they'll be able to make that connection between those two things. So you're both um, artists who you're well known for working together, but you also have established practices, separate practices. How did you come to work together? <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, we met in 2013 and it was actually through another art, a performance that I was doing where I was, it's called Social Turker. So I was going on these dates and I would stream them to the internet and then pay um, mechanical Turk workers to watch and direct me what to say and do. Um, I mean, not unlike the kind of, you know, live feeds that we have now where you can comment, but that didn't exist at the time. Um, and in that series of um, dates over that performance, I ended up, uh, I guess, as a result of that kind of meeting Kyle and um, yeah. And then I think from there, we realized like we both had a real interest in um, sort of experimenting with the social um, systems around us and also the technological systems and thinking about how that plays out in terms of understanding relationships um, and identity. And so that's some that has played out in our own relationship and in the collaborative works that, that we've done. Yeah, I think we tried to create a lot of these, the, the same way that we create spaces for other people to experience different kinds of technology and mediations and relationships. Um, what through apps or in galleries, I think we're, um, or in exhibitions, I think we're doing a lot of that in our own life as well. We're creating pieces for ourselves and interventions that we don't even talk about or document as artworks, things that just modify our interaction a little bit. Um, and uh, I, yeah, it's kind of an ongoing uh, process of exploration for both of us. Um, I think that's kind of what we connected over initially and it's what we're still doing a lot of the time. How do you decide which is solo work and which is joint? Do you ever fight over some of the solo <laughs> work and say, no, that was my idea. I had that one first. <laughs> well, it's easy because it's usually always Lauren's idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, uh, it, but actually that's not completely inaccurate. There's some of, some of the first projects we worked on together really started as um, kind of long running you know, ideas that Lauren had been thinking about. And then it just turned out that it brought to light something that, or connected with something that I'd been thinking about and that kind of added, a, I could add a little bit to it. Um, I think af after our first few pieces together, then they were really more um, genuinely collaborative, but some of the first things we did were definitely coming from Lauren's <laughs> deepest, darkest fears and ideas. Um, 
but uh, I don't I don't think we have a kind of disagreement about what we what we do and don't work on together. Um, I think we sort of our our collaborative practice um, helps inform our individual practices, but um, it's always pretty clear. I think you know, like I have projects I work on that. Like a recent argument has been, I have some projects I'm working on that are pretty antagonistic um, against like the police or against military state or things like that. And um, Lauren is like pushing back against me doing some of these kinds of projects in ways that are, are like- Are you gonna cast me as defending the police here? <laughs> <laughs> in ways that are really making me consider like more carefully the way that I'm working on this um, and, and uh, trying to understand better, you know, what the most effective mode of working as an artist can be. And um, so there's not really any question that like we, that I'm gonna be doing this independently. <laughs> um, and you have, you know, plenty of projects that are, uh, you know, about your sort of personal lived experience that are very subjectively informed or, or they're very expressive. And, you know, I'm not going to jump in there and be like, you know, <laughs> here's how we should do it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's very easy. Um, sometimes we'll have an idea together or sometimes one of us will have an idea and the other person will get very excited about it and we'll start talking about it and then it'll be kind of like, oh, well, should we work on this together? Um, and then other times it, one of us will have an idea and be working on something and it's very clear that it's, it's not a moment to collaborate. So, um, yeah, and I think there's even been collaborations where like we wouldn't necessarily call them a collaborative project, but maybe it's like, hey i have some funding to make this project can i like pay you yeah, some exactly. amount of funding to like help me with this um part of it that i don't know how to do so it's it's it is a collaboration but it's not like a a work that we would put both our names on and in, in you know as the kind of lead artist yeah i think we have a, a the the thing that we're really good with is um we communicate with each other really well and we can kind of maintain i think good boundaries about um through that communication, we can maintain really good boundaries about, you know, whose work is this and um, why, why is this being created? And that allows us to work together, work separately, hire each other, whatever needs to happen. Because I think the thing that we both share is we both really care about the work that we're making and um, we can see that in each other and support that in each other. And you've got a solo show coming up soon in um, Shanghai, I think September the 20th, Lauren. Yeah. How is that feeling? That's a massive solo show. And again, you're doing it remotely. What challenges have you got there? Yeah, um, it's, it will be at a place called Brownie Project. Um, and it's created by Iris Long. And um, it's it's a big challenge because it's entirely remote. I won't be able to go there. Um, and we're doing a lot of works that are very interactive um, or like staging a, a performance. And there've also been a lot of um, just difficulties with shipping and imports or things that we didn't want to risk. So we're actually like refabricating or, um, you know, re-putting together things <laughs> over there rather than trying to ship them. Um, so I think I would normally feel very worried about it, but I just, the team there has been great and the curator is fantastic. So I actually am feeling um, like there's a lot of work to do, but it's sort of coming together. But I think it'll be very, um, it's very strange, you know, cause they sent me like a video walkthrough of the space and a SketchUp model and just like laying out the works and trying to get a sense of like um, the space, it, it really like, you have to go into total like virtual mode of just like imagining yourself into this virtual space and um, walking around in it. So I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see how it, <laughs> how it comes out. And I'm excited about it. And Kyle, what are you working on at the moment? Yeah, I'm, um, I've got a few projects lined up right now that are also connected to face analysis and, um, understanding expressions and um, understanding the way that uh, facial um, coding and attribute recognition is um, being used by um, social media companies and by the police. Um, one of them's a game, one of them's one of these more antagonistic projects I was mentioning. Um, 
I, but I'm also working on a completely different direction, which is connected to indigenous technology. Um, I'm, I've been, uh, since we moved to LA a few years ago, I got back into sailing, something I've been doing since I was a kid. And um, it brought me to some of the, um, some of the culture of like long ocean voyaging in the Pacific. Um, and I, <laughs> I learned about this really interesting phenomena called telapa, which is this flash of light that emanates from land and reefs at night. Um, in a shoot of kind of burst of light in a straight line um, that can guide your way towards um, islands. And uh, I've, so I've, after I found out about this, I've been working with some folks from a small island called Tamako, where they use this as part of their kind of voyaging technology um, to um, help kind of guide themselves and find um, wayfind out on the ocean. Um, they've been documenting like their process and um, their culture for the last 30 years to share with outsiders. But this has been one thing that they've had trouble documenting because it's really uh, kind of faint burst of light. Um, so I've been working with them to like get some really low light cameras out on the ocean so that we can capture it and share it. Um, and in that process, I've been learning like a bunch about uh, their perspective on how technology and society and science can all kind of relate to each other, which has been kind of reframing the way I think about things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and um, social media <laughs> and surveillance. How is it reframed? It? It's well, I think the big thing is we are, it's, let's say in the West or like in non-indigenous societies as outsiders, we, we have a, we have a different perspective on like how we build technology. We sort of just like throw it out there into the world and hope that it's going to make us money or maybe make the world a better place because we're so well-intentioned. Um, <laughs> and uh, in, from what I've been learning from most indigenous cultures, the way that technology is used is it's really addressing pretty specific needs and there's a lot of accountability around um, how it's rolled out and um, there's a lot of uh, kind of group accountability for kind of supporting it um, to the extent that it is useful and kind of managing and maintaining it as a as a collective um, instead of what we do with like you know Facebook being a single point of contact for all of us to connect with each other and them having the final say on what people can and can't say or what people should and shouldn't see um, or how kind of advertising should be um, rolled out or what should and shouldn't be tracked. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's giving me a, a bit more of, I guess, a collectivist type mindset for how technology can coexist with culture. Yeah, so it's a gra ground up approach rather than a top down. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. Yeah. So just finish the interview with one last question, which is what are your real feelings about emotion and technology? <laughs> mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because I've been thinking about it since we opened talking about the piece. And I realized like we talked a lot about the sort of surveillance and our relationship to it. Um, but I don't think the piece is really about surveillance. It's, that is a, a theme of it, but it's the, the question for me is thinking about in this moment where I think because of the pandemic and because of a lot of things going on, we've really started to consider like what is our effect on other people? You know, like there was this moment where everything's closing down and people's kind of personal boundaries are shrinking. Um, and just starting to see other people as threats, like very physically. Um, and then I think, you know, especially maybe in this country, we're feeling it a lot. I don't know how it is in the UK, but um, just starting to, like with, with a lot of the racial uprising and protests, like, and these kind of political conversations we're having leading up to the election, um, just un really understanding in a, a deep way how much effect like one person can have on another and what that's what that means for society is that ripples outward and so I think with this piece and thinking about emotion and technology we're thinking about like 
what does it mean to stop for a moment and like really think about that and look at that and say what you know what is this emotional effect that we're having on the people around us is it positive is it negative um what does it mean that i'm wearing a mask and it suddenly becomes much harder to even tell what what it is that i'm feeling um and people are reacting to that too and then if it's possible with technology to kind of deduce or add a layer that makes us more conscious or aware of the emotional impact we're having on others um could does that lead to some sort of like greater reflection or self-awareness or does that does that go down the path of like what's being done with this data and how is that being used um, when you look and see some countries that have almost uh, like kind of social impact scores and things like that um, so I think that's where it gets really complicated um, so I guess if I were to <laughs> summarize that it's just like thinking about this piece for for me is really about like what is that moment of contact and how aware are we of our um, ability to really impact others just even through through the words that we say and also just the the body language the facial expression the all these kind of unspoken signals that we put out to each other and how is that shifting in this moment i've been i've been thinking about um how i've been thinking about the distinction between sort of how we appear and how we identify a lot recently um and in the context of expressions uh you know we use our we use our face we use our body language to try and communicate how we feel uh it's hardwired into our nervous system it's also something we do consciously um, but it's also not something that everyone is sort of equally adept with communicating and or reading um, from each other and um, i think in that kind of gap between what we are feeling and how we express it or how we see it in other people. There's a lot of space for um, kind of misunderstanding, but also um, some poetry and some, um, I don't know, some, there, I don't know, there's a space for some kind of beautiful misunderstanding as well. Um, and I think to the extent that we continue to automate some of these kinds of, uh, this kind of reading or this kind of expressing, um, we are losing some of that potential um, for misunderstanding. We're sort of like wiping it away and pretending that the misunderstandings don't exist. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, in, in my, that's my, those are my feelings about um, this kind of technology is that to, we should be careful about automating these things that are usually a space for these kind of beautiful poetic misunderstandings and just pretending that that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, the messiness of the unknown and the mistake and, and the poetry of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much you. for your piece. Um, yeah. And all the best with your next projects. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, nice you. Nice to talk with thank you. you.